in the present lecture we intend to examine the inscriptions of sachi sachi is located in the rayasin district of madhya pradesh in the early centuries of christian era it was a very important settlement of buddhist monks and uh, it has a long history the history which traverses a period of about 1600 years it was originally settled in the 3rd century bc people continued to build monuments and continue to build beautiful stupas in this area for a period of 1600 years the stupa of sachi still remains a beautiful monument to the artistic achievements of people who lived in the 2nd century bc now we intend to study the inscriptions of sachi because in a certain sense it's a key to understanding many features of the history of madhya pradesh and in many ways the history of india madhya pradesh as we know is a place which represents a P an area of transition between north india and south india it typically shows many features that are characteristics of north india and at the same time many other features which characterize south indian traditions however in today's world madhya pradesh is generally regarded as an area which speaks indo european languages an area which has typically the kinship tradition the tradition of marriage the tradition of family that belongs to north india if we examine the evidence from the inscriptions of sachi they can provide us interesting ideas about what could have been happening in this area in the 2nd century bc sachi is also important because as we know the brahmi script which is the earliest script of historic india was deciphered by sir james princip and james princip managed to decipher ashokan inscriptions which is also written in in uh, the brahmi script he managed to decipher these inscriptions with the help of inscriptions from sachi because he assumed that these many of these inscriptions which have words like gift of isidasi from ujjain ujjain normally in sanskrit they will end with the words danam isidasa sa danam so he the first words written in the brahmi script that could be deciphered and read were the words danam from sachi and once he managed to read these two three letters he managed to decipher and read other letters that are connected with the brahmi script as such now what i intend to do in the present lecture is to try and examine some notions that connect with the idea of kinship at sachi it's important for us because as all of us know in the tradition of sociology and anthropology the study of kinship and family and marriage is a key element of the social structure while historians have focused more on categories like class on categories like developments in the field of economy and religion they have generally ignored issues related to the study of kinship related to study of changes in patterns of kinship so 
we have very little information about the kind of family structures that prevailed in India in early period of history. It's normally assumed that family has remained the same from the early Vedic period onwards, meaning that whether we are talking about a family of the early Vedic period, whether we are talking about a family of the Gupta period, or whether we are talking about family in today's India, all of them had the same kind of a structure. Now, this needs to be questioned and this needs to be historicized. In today's India, we know that there are various kinds of kinship traditions. The two major kinship traditions in India are called the Indo-Aryan kinship tradition and the Dravidian kinship tradition. When we talk about Dravidian kinship tradition, it has some significant variations from the North Indian counterparts. One major difference is that in the Dravidian kinship tradition, there is the practice of what is called cross-cousin marriage, meaning that in Dravidian traditions, people can marry their mother's brother's daughter, something that is prohibited in the North Indian tradition. Now, that brings about a very, very significant difference in the understanding of kinship for South Indian areas like Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. These practices, when we talk about the Dravidian tradition, we talk about a distinctive linguistic tradition and we also talk about a distinctive kinship tradition, which varies from North Indian linguistic tradition of Indo-European languages and the North Indian linguistic tradition is also connected with this patrilineal patriarchal tradition which prevails in this part of the world. Now, when we talk about South Indian linguistic tradition and South Indian kinship tradition, which I am using as an example of the Dravidian uh, kinship tradition, it's interesting that the marriages in South India take place between villages which are closer to each other compared to marriages in North India. In fact, according to some studies, the South Indian marriages, they cover, if they cover an area of about uh, 6 or 7 kilometers intervillage distance, in, South, in North India, it will extend to about 70 kilometers. So there is this exchange of women between patrilineal structures. In North India, women have to move away to other households which are located at a much greater distance compared to South Indian counterparts as such. Now, if we study the inscriptions at Sachi, what is clear is that most of the kinship terms, they seem to indicate that it was, the prevailing practice was that of North Indian, Indo-European kinship structure. However, some scholars, scholars like Professor Kumkum Roy, have noticed that these inscriptions do not show the evidence of the presence of father's brothers, or for that matter, other relatives like father's brother's wife or father's brother's son. She has concluded on that basis that maybe the kind of family structures that existed were very different uh, in those times. However, if we examine the evidence carefully, we realize that it has got to do with some of the limitations of the language 
that they were using. If we look at the Pali, Prakrit and Sanskrit languages, it turns out that the term for father's brother is almost absent. Although there are words for it, they are rarely used in any of these languages. Similarly, father's brother's son is normally called with, by the same term as one's own son. And father's brother is called by the same term as father. So, pita can be used for father as well as father's brother. And son can be used for for brother's son as well as one's own son. This becomes evident if we look at the evidence from the Mahabharata where Dhritarashtra has to make a distinction between his own children and children of his brother Pandu. In fact, he simply does not have a word to distinguish these two categories of children and he seems to struggle. The Mahabharat evidence shows that he is all the time trying to say that they are not my children except that his language does not have the words to express this sentiment. In fact, the popular words in North India today are Chacha, Chachi and Chachera Bhai. These are terms which are Turkey in origin. They came with the Turks who came to India in the 12th, 13th century and they became popular in the North Indian languages. This seems to indicate to us that although the Sachi inscriptions do not mention names of uh, categories for father's brother or father's brother's son, we can safely assume that these categories are covered by terms like son, terms like uh, brother as such or terms like father for that matter, they safely cover these categories. Now, apart from that, we have also evidences from other texts from ancient India that seem to indicate that there were joint families which existed in early India in the later Vedic period or for that matter even in Arthashastra that is around 2nd century BC to 2nd century AD we had families where father and father's brother lived together in one household. What I intend to examine now is to see the evidence for other kinds of kinship system that might have prevailed in this area. As pointed out earlier, most of the donors who came to this place, they came from various areas of Madhya Pradesh. Although some of the donors mentioned places which have been located in Rajasthan, in present day Uttar Pradesh and in Maharashtra. However, most other places, they seem to be located inside Madhya Pradesh itself. Now, what is important is that when they mention their kinship categories, they obviously reflect the practices of the particular geographical area that we call Madhya Pradesh. It's important for us because there are many inscriptions which seem to indicate that a different kind of family structure prevailed in many areas of Madhya Pradesh. Now, this different kind of family structure can be culled out, can be discovered by carefully studying the inscriptions of Sachi. As pointed out earlier, these inscriptions are very, very short. But if they are telling us about their kinship identities, some of these kinship identities seem to indicate that probably they didn't belong to the Indo-European system of kinship. One such example is that there are many people, many women who have given gifts. They 
refer to themselves as mothers of women meaning that they say i am this woman's mother and i am giving gifts now this is a practice which is not generally followed in north india in north india if women are trying to define themselves uh, in terms of their identity they will normally define themselves as the wife of so and so meaning that they will mention a male similarly they will mention a son they will say that i am the mother of such a person such a male as such rather than a female so if they are mentioning that they are mother of a particular woman that seems to indicate a different kind of family structure there are other inscriptions where mothers daughters and sisters are making gifts together again this is a practice which seems to be slightly at variance with north indian practices normally gifts given today are by a husband wife combination the gifts are normally either given by males or females for that matter sometimes they give independent gifts but here is a situation where three four women come together and give gifts which seems to indicate a greater independence for these women who have certain resources available to them to be able to make these gifts it's important for us to remember that the dravidian kinship system allows greater freedom to women greater control over resources to women which is not the case with the north indian indo european family system then there is this case where men refer to their identity as son of women again in the north indian tradition when men are referring to their identities they will mention the name of their father even today most of the forms that we fill up for applying for admissions in colleges or applying for jobs we write our names and we write the names of our fathers it's very rare that we come across forms where we are expected to write the names of our mothers so if there are inscriptions where men are mentioning themselves identifying themselves as sons of some woman it definitely seems to indicate a different pattern of kinship compared to north india then we also have some interesting gifts by this person called varadatt he seems to have been a very very rich person because he gave several gifts in sachi and gifts which would have required enormous resources because sachi has got very rich carvings carvings which will require enormous amount of labor and also skill as such very high degree of skill which could create such carvings as such so varadatt one of the gift givers has given five six such gifts but what is interesting about this person is that he gives his gifts along with his sister or for that matter his sister's sons now this is again a pattern which does not fit into the pattern of kinship structure in north india in north india the normal pattern is that at a certain age a woman is married off a girl is married off to a family uh, and then she is considered part of the groom's family she loses all her links with the own family with her the family of her birth and normally traditionally she also had no property rights over uh her uh over her parents family as such so in a certain sense the woman becomes 
permanently a part of the family where she has been married off. So in traditional India, one rarely, rarely comes across examples of gift giving where a person gives gifts with his sister or and his sister's children. So if Varadatta is giving gifts to his uh, with his sister or with his sister's children, this definitely seems to indicate prevalence of a different kind of family structure. All these evidences seem to indicate that many of the gift givers in Sachi were probably part of a different kind of family structure. This is the evidence that we have is very very limited but this evidence can now be buttressed by other kinds of evidences. One kind of evidence as we pointed out when we looked at the place names in Sachi we found that many of the place names had name endings which sounded like words from Dravidian languages which indicates that this area had many places which had names with Dravidian names endings. So you have evidence of the prevalence of a different kind of language. You also have the evidence of prevalence of a different kind of kinship structure. Also, if we look at the Buddhist literature, it refers to this particular area as Avanti. And in many examples, they call Avanti, Avanti Dakshinapat, which literally means Avanti, the place in the southern, southern part of the world as such. Now, Dakshinapat, traditionally, in the minds of people who are writing in North India, refer to this world which was characterized by Dravidian languages and Dravidian kinship system. So this evidence also seems to indicate that the area of Sachi and the area of Madhya Pradesh probably at some point in its history had strong elements of Dravidian kinship system. This fact in fact is further buttressed by the evidence that we find about the Yadava clans who seem to have lived in the areas extending from Mathura to Ujjain. Now, there are many Yadava clans. We know about Krishna, Balaram and many of the Yadava leaders who were also, who are also worshipped in Indian tradition. If we look at the marriage patterns of the Yadava groups, who were the ruling groups in this area, we find that they also practiced cross-cousin marriage. Now, this practice is more in consonance with the practices of present-day Dravidian kinship system areas like Andhra Pradesh, like Tamil Nadu and Karnataka rather than practices of North India. And that is why it's important for us to rethink that maybe the area of Madhya Pradesh represented the transition area between North India and South India, meaning the Dravidian system of kinship and the Indo-European system of kinship that prevailed in those times. In modern times, scholars like Iravati Karve have pointed out that the area of Maharashtra represents the transitional area between the Indo-European kinship system and the South Indian Dravidian kinship system. It seems that in the early centuries of the Christian era, it was the area of Madhya Pradesh that represented the transitional area between the Indo-European kinship system and the Dravidian kinship system. Thank you.